I, I must offer my apologies because this story, as I said, it's an Irish folk tale. So the only way to do it is with, with a cod Irish accent. So I, I will ask those in the room to forgive me and um, cra I crave their indulgence because I'm not meaning to take the piss. It's just the best I can do. Take it as a tribute, not as an insult. Yes, and as you gathered, there should have been a whole band here that didn't include me, but just use your imagination. It's the story of a sheen. Now, a sheen was a mighty poet, a man feared and revered through all Ireland for his power with words. Not just a few years ago, but over a thousand years ago, in the heroic days of Ireland, when it was called Erin, and the Fenians were alive and well. Blind. But the worlds he conjured with his poems were so real and so palpable that it was as if he was blessed with more than perfect vision. And when people listened to him, they held so firmly in the world that he span that they began to think it was they who were blind. And his visions were the true reality. Now, Despite this magic, Oshin was never a popular man, and there was a great sadness in his life. He told wonderful stories of love and romance, yet like all his tales, they were purely imaginary. Girls were too frightened by his ugly, weird manner and by his uncanny perception, which seemed to see right into their hearts and lay them bare. One day, while he was musing by a well, he idly threw down a stone, and in the echoing clatter and plump, far away splash in the water, there came to him a strange story. Or was it the truth? He couldn't tell. Anyway, the story was that there is a magic land called Tir Nanog, where everything is beautiful and everyone is forever young. A land where the blossoms of spring, spring never fade, even as the fruits of autumn ripen. Well, Tir Nanog was ruled by a king, but the kingship was not passed down through the generations, for a son might wait forever since his father would never age. Instead, a king was chosen for seven years from among the champions and best men of the kingdom. At the end of seven years, the champions and best men would come together on the great green verge in front of the palace, high above the misty plain. And on the sound of the huge horn, they would all plunge down the hill and run like the wind through the trees, 
and far away to the top of the hill, two miles distant. And on the top of that hill was a chair. And the man that reached the chair first and sat down became king of Tyr and Anog for the next seven years. Now, one king was an especially strong runner, and he had won the kingship seven times in a row. But as the years went past, he became more and more concerned lest someone should beat him to the chair next time, and he wore a deep furrow in the floor from pacing anxiously to and fro. So, one day, he called his druid to him and asked the wizened old buzzard, how long will it be before any man sits in the chair before me and takes the crown? The chair and the crown are yours forever, said the druid gravely, looking deep and long at the king, unless your own son takes them from you. Now, the king had no sons, so he was mightily relieved. But he was a clever man and knew all about those crafty little prophecies that caught you by surprise by slipping in through the back door. No, he had no sons, but he had a daughter, the finest girl in Tiernanog, and the like of her could not be found in Erin, nor anywhere else, nor in any lovely dawn since the beginning of the world. Oh yes, she might marry, the king realised, and then it would be her husband that was his son, and could beat him to the chair to fulfil the prophecy. And he knew then that his daughter could never marry. Yet uh, she was a headstrong girl who would defy him till the world turned backwards and the stars fell from the sky. So one fine evening, as the last rays of sun were performing their golden alchemy on the palace walls, he called her and the druid to him in the small chamber overlooking the fountain. For a while, the three stood in silence while well, outside the window a pair of swallows swooped and swerved in and out of the falling water, their shadows racing as huge curves across the stone paving. Then, as the daughter turned to watch them, the king stepped quietly forward and took from the druid his weird and twisted rod of spells, carved long ago from blackthorn. Striking the girl gently on the back of the head with the rod, he quickly muttered a phrase in the ancient language. The strange words seemed to roll from his mouth and spread like a marsh mist across the floor, wrapping themselves round the princess's feet. At once, the girl's beautiful head began to change, as if a reflection in water broken by the wind. Her lovely hair, hair grew stiff and coarse. Her delicate nose turned huge and snouty. Her petal pink lips flat wide and thick and ugly. And then the sweet voice that had made even the bubbling waters of Erin Moor pause to listen cracked into a horrible grunt. And by the time the echo of the king's words had dwindled away, the princess's head had changed to that <gasps> of an old sow. Seeing the dreadful image of her face darting back off the king's breastplate, that girl covered her face and fled from the chamber. Well, said the king, harshly, as a single tear ran down his face and stained the white marble where it dropped to the floor. There's not a man who'll marry her now. And he handed the druid back his rod and turned on his heel. Now, the druid had watched all this, struck dumb by shock. And seeing the pig's head on the princess, he was sorry he told the king so much. He wanted to mend some of the damage. So, after a long, long moment's thought... He determined to risk the king's wrath and talk to the princess at once. 
It was some while before he found her. Weeping gently by this shady pool at the falls, at the foot of the falls of Shemaw. And it was as if, it was as if the very waters wept with her as tears, her tears mingled in the stream. The druid stood by and silently wept too, and his tears were swept away by the current. At last, the girl looked up and saw him. Must I be in this way forever? he asked the druid, holding his gaze with her sad, piggy eyes. Ah, that you must, for there's no gainsaying such a spell. Unless you marry one of the sons of Finn McCool in Erin, he said. If you gain the love and marry a son of Finn, then you boitly, freed from the blot that is on you now, and get back your own head and countenance. Oh, when she heard this news, she was impatient, and she leapt up and started running through the hills and valleys like a hunted heart, her cloak flowing and flattering out behind. And she did not rest until she had left the land of Tian and Og and come to Erin. Then, stepping out into the grey-green morning mist that was draped like a huge web over the land, she paused for breath and pulled the hood of her cloak deep over her head. For weeks, she wandered far across the field and moor, asking in a hoarse whisper for under her hood for you news of the Fenians, as the sons of Erin were called. Each person she met shook his or, head or her head and hurriedly passed on by, secretly crossing their fingers against danger. Then, at last, she encountered a laughing young boy who looked at her strangely, then darted away, shouting mischievously at her, that Finn and the Fenians of Erin were to be found on Knock and Ah. Almost overcome with relief, she set out on her way to that high hill without delay. The bushes seemed to be chuckling in the breeze she skipped by, and the grass almost smiled as it bent beneath her feather-light feet. In no time, she had ricked She'd reached Knock and Ah and strode boldly up through the moonlight into to the small group of sturdy, handsome men that sat round a glowing fire, carefully polishing their spears and swords. And are you the sons of Erin? She started to ask, thinking to enchant them with that lovely voice of hers that could charm the morning lark from the sky. But all that emerged from her mouth was a ghastly, rasping grunt. The sons of Erin paused a while in astonishment, then began to chuckle quietly, one by one, and as they did, she flung back her hood back in anger, forgetting the secret it hid. Seeing her picky head, the Fenians began to laugh. And as the princess grunted louder and louder, the men all laughed louder and louder until they were all swept up in a huge guffaw, so gigantic that the very trees shook with the force of their merriment. And there I'm going to leave it, because, you, because it, is, there's a, it was, uh, there's another 15 minutes, I'm sure you've all got beds to go to. So I'll come back to it another time. So if you like the story, Come back and I'll give you more next time. <laughs>